Awesome. Before anybody's throwing any questions. If you're on a small lot, then I think you're worthwhile. Indeed. I, I was just in Massachusetts. We have a branch in Massachusetts, and lo and behold, this guy in Lexington, Massachusetts, put in this 8,000 watt tracker in his backyard. And uh, it's just like, wow. But, you know, it, and it doesn't have the full benefit of an east to west horizon view of the sun. Um, but he went for it because he's wanted, you know, he had spotty sun, he just wanted to pick up all the sun he could. So, <laughs> pretty, pretty neat. So, uh, what size is your inverter? Uh, this is a 4,000 watt inverter. And uh, that's a good question, you know, how, does, how, how, how big do you make the inverter relative to the array? Kind of depends on a number of factors. If you want the maximum lifespan out of the inverter, I would argue you want about a one to one perhaps, you know, or, but from an economic standpoint, you may say, well, um, solar panels generally don't produce their nameplate rated wattage. So for instance, I have a 3.7 kilowatt system on my roof. I've never seen 3.7 kilowatts come out of it. Uh, I've seen uh, close, I've seen 3,400. Um, and that has to do not because the panels are efficient, it just has to do with the fact that the panels are rated at room temperature. And the power output of the solar panel is highly temperature dependent. And contrary to what you might think, heat is not good. So if you've got a solar thermal system, obviously it's all about the heat with solar electric. Heat is actually a degradation. It actually causes the voltage that I described earlier to re be reduced. So instead of it being operating at half a volt per cell, you're down at, um, it's a direct correlation. In fact, it's so linear, you can look at the voltage of your array and tell what temperature it is outside if you do the math. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So we're more efficient here than in Arizona where it gets hotter. Indeed, yeah. So really, your best, <coughs> most productive day is going to be, I mean, obviously, you want the, pan the you know, the solar, the sunlight has to be perpendicular to the cells, right? So if you're off angle, right off the bat, you're never going to get that peak power out of that panel. But let's say you are, um, your best conditions would be bright, clear skies and cold. So I saw at the solar, one of the solar decathlon houses that uh, the CU uh, students, engineering students put together, they actually combined them and they were taking solar thermal off the back <coughs> of PV panels cooling the panels and saving the heat to a storage tank. Yeah, clever idea. I mean, I've always wondered why more people aren't doing that because you get that benefit of cooling the panel down right. and getting the residual heat. You have a single device that's doing both. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, show me a commercial version of one. So the only thing I can think of is that adding water electricity is just, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, honestly, I think that's gotta be what it is. I mean, you're, okay. you know, it's like start, <laughs> otherwise I don't understand why it's not. Because, water. because, uh, uh, because they water cool electric car motors in some of the designs, and that's why yeah, I'm well, in fact, right? in uh, supercomputers, they've got water cooling systems on the Yeah, so I, I wouldn't so think I that would really be an objection. Plumbers and yeah, electricians yeah. don't like to talk to each other. That's not the same union. I have to tell you that on our solar eraser, we did a lot of experimentation with putting misters on the front that misted the whole panel. Oh, neat. Oh, there you oh, go. Really? And, 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 oh, yeah. and that worked, right? It worked. Yeah. yeah. The, the irony was what worked, what worked as well was going out to Palm Springs and three days of the, of the crystalline uh, sand in Palm Springs accumulating on the panel made it more efficient. Than <laughs> Oh, really? Oh, yeah. You might be on this on there. So that's how they're wasting our water. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what to do to your drag coefficient? Uh, a deck or something below. You don't want that snow sliding. And, and, <laughs> and it's, 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 you know, it's been a good storm. We haven't had real issues, but there's been stories of, you know, <clears throat> tables imploding. And so wow. another reason is to move them up. And then another thing that's going on is uh, the fire code is changing. The fire guys want to be able to get into your attic if you have a fire, so now they want perimeters around the array. So just another reason to consider sun power because now you're, you, you, you've got less roof to work with to begin with. So, um, so what about uh, east, east west versus uh, yeah, south? Yeah, east west. So um, generally, east west, you're going to take about a 20% penalty, you know, roughly speaking. And then the, the more shallow you are, the closer you are to flat. And flat, you're at about 80%, right? So the steeper you are east west, the, the less good it is. Mm. But for a typical 30 degree pitched roof, you're going to be about. 80%, is that right, guys? Mm -hmm. well, yeah. 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 So, so if, if, you, if you've got a sloped roof that's east-west, can you, can you cheat on the angle when you mount them on the roof? Or no, don't, don't you no. You don't, the thing you don't want to do is prop up panels on an asphalt shingle roof because you're going to create snow damming and you're going you're gonna to have water issues in your roof. So we never prop up panels on a shingle roof. Um, on a metal roof, you could consider it. On a, on a flat roof, uh, we, 
we definitely do. Uh, commercial roofs we do. So yeah. There's, there's a you react to the Holiday neighborhood. There's some orientation of houses south, right? Next right. To the neighborhood. There's a place down in Iris, a neighborhood, a development that's got all kind of solar south facing. So uh, everything you say is like, well, it depends, right? It's a uh, most of the installations are a custom job. Right. Is there any movement towards zoning, especially places like Boulder, to kind of no. development should face south, you know, the house should be oriented to make it easier? Is that um, I don't happen? believe so, but if it would happen anywhere, it'd be here in Boulder. <laughs> <laughs> so does, it, does anybody know about that? I mean, you guys, you heard about it? I mean, there's, there's a HERS rating in Boulder where you, you have to do energy efficiency measures, one of which can be solar PV. So a lot of people are doing that sort because they have to if they're, if they're building. But orient, orienting the house, um, I would think they would consider that just for obvious reasons. Well, it seems like those developments, maybe the developer, you know, the developers themselves, right. made the decision. Is that part of was that kind of what was happening? There, there's been a couple neighborhoods in here in Boulder where that's happened. Um, one is off Iris, which is the right. yeah. west. Yeah. Um, but I think that's strictly the priority of the developer. But is he coupling? So um, all right, uh, I'll describe it. Um, See. I'll describe it first and then we'll do it. So uh, the downside, well not downside, but the limitation is when the power goes out with a conventional grid tie solar system, you lose power too. And as I was describing earlier, that, that's utilities want that. The inverters are UL listed to make sure that happens. I mean, frankly, they can't even operate without a grid signal. They're designed, they need that signal in order to operate. So um, so not that there's a lot of power outages, but you know, there has been, and depending on where you live, if you're at the end of the line, power quality can be poor. So um, um, a better backup option is something to consider for that, and it basically keeps your solar system working when the grid's down. And uh, I'll describe exactly how that happens. And if you have an electric car, you can charge a car off of this kind of a system. We've installed a number of those types of systems for people uh, where they're interested in being able to power the car from their array when the, when the grid's down. So. So first of all, um, I'll just describe, I, I pulled the system in a box for the sake of kind of getting it in and out of the way. Typically in a house, we would install this in the garage, and the shelf, inverted on the wall, it would look something like this, and, and that's what it would be, but um, this, this makes it kind of mobile and kind of put everything in, in one spot. So, so I'll first talk about the components of the system, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go off the grid. So um, I know you can't all see, you can kind of come here as you can, I'll describe this in this box, but uh, right on top is a, a battery-based inverter. I already described a, a solar inverter, right? It needs DC power from the array to work. And, it, and the other thing it does that I didn't mention is um, not only does it just simply take that DC power and process it in AC, but it forces those panels up there to operate at the sweet spot. It's called maximum power point tracking. A solar panel can operate um, at any voltage depending on what it's connected to. And these inverters make sure that it's operating at, at the sweet spot. So. Mechanically thinking of it, it'd be like if you're in a stick shift car or truck, you wouldn't be starting up in third gear, right? The motor's not matched to the load, so this is kind of electronic matching of the load to the to, to the production, if you will, kind of thing. So, um, so this is a battery-based inverter. It uses DC power from a battery bank. In this case, it's a 48 volt battery bank. And um, uh, so, you know, I'll swarm me at the moment. I'll, I'll, you guys can come in later. I'll just describe it. But in the bottom here, I've got. It's filled with um, large 8D um, AGM batteries, so they're truck batteries. They're about 20 inches by 10 inches by 10 inches, 160 pounds each, uh, lead acid AGM. Uh, the reason we use those is they're uh, maintenance free. They produce no gases. You kind of set them and you forget them. I mean, it's really uh, a nice thing. Uh, they're more expensive than a conventional lead acid battery, almost a, to the tune of twice as much. So. If you're a battery file, like some of you might be, and you're willing to visit your battery bank once in a while and add a little bit of distilled water, you know, you might want to go with uh, wet batteries, particularly if you put them in the garage where you can ventilate them because they do produce gas. So um, in this case, no gas, no fuss, no muss, and uh, they sit in the bottom. <coughs> so the inverter just operates off of that battery bank, but of course that battery bank needs to get charged. Um, the inverter is hyper capable and can charge uh, from two different AC sources. So Normally when the grid is available, it'll keep those batteries charged from the grid, just float charged. Um, and then if the power goes out, um, you can plug in a generator that can help support the battery bank. And you can even do that automatically. So, um, which is what, what an off-grid system, the way that it works is it's 
there is no grid. So mm -hmm. it's basically utilizing sunlight, wind if you use wind. You know, if that's insufficient to keep the batteries fully charged, and the batteries start dropping, the signal goes out to the generator, it starts the generator, the inverter charges up the battery banks and shuts the generator off. So it's a very seamless and efficient process. So, um, so basically what we have here is an off-grid inverter in that case. So the neat thing is, um, and I'll describe now, is how do you interface this battery-based inverter with a conventional grid-tie solar system? Off-grid, you have the option of the solar array being wired to the battery bank directly. It's called DC coupling, which is the conventional way to do this. AC coupling is important because most people aren't going to build a system or necessarily build a system um, off-grid in the first place. There's thousands and thousands of systems in Colorado now that are just this grid-tie inverter. So how do you incorporate a battery-based inverter to a grid-tie inverter? And the answer is actually very simply. Um, basically, um, if you're going to back up your whole house, you install a transfer switch, um, much as you would, or exactly as you would if you were putting a generator onto your house. When you transfer the house over to the auxiliary, either automatically or manually, instead of a generator being connected to that switch, this inverter is connected to that switch. So you throw the switch, boom, now the inverter is running the house, and I'll do that in just a moment. And the grid time inverter is full. It's like, hey, the grid's back. So it starts doing its business, just as I described, and just pumping power into the house. And um, the difference being, if you have more power than the house can use, instead of going out to the grid, that energy is flowing into the battery bank. Um, <coughs> now, now one of the key tricks is, well, what do you do when the battery bank is full? Because this thing is not really communicating necessarily with this thing. It's just, it's a grid time inverter. So yeah, I got the grid, I'm pushing power. As long as the power is stable, I'm gonna keep doing that. So um, a key component to these systems is being able to disable this inverter when it has nowhere to put the power. Because you can't really throttle these things down. It's either, it's all or nothing. Um, and with that said, there's one exception. SMA, as we talked about, manufacturers in Denver here, they do make a battery-based inverter that does actually communicate with their grid time inverters. And it ends up being, it can thr throttle that inverter down. Um, but that's, um, so you can go to the Sunny Island system, that's called Sunny Island from SMA. But in this case, it's a non-Sunny Island system. Um, it's actually less expensive, so there's, there's reasons not to use their gear, but um, I won't get into that. So what's neat about this inverter, and this is a Schneider Electric um, Xantrex, used to be called Xantrex, which used to be called Trace, and for some of you guys that have been reading Home Power and whatnot, um, Trace like created the off-grid market in the United States in the 80s, you know. So all the inverters I started installing in the, in the early 90s and so forth, everything was Trace this, Trace that, it was, they really made their name. Incredible product, super reliable. And then they, um, they sold out at one point to Xantrex, a Canadian conglomerate, um, <coughs> who owned them for a long time. And then Xantrex sold out to Schneider Electric, which is one of the biggest electrical, electronic companies in the world, French company. So now Schneider Electric. But the, but the beauty of it is they actually kept a lot of the the architecture of the original inverters, which is like bomb proof. I mean, I, I can tell you, I, of all the off-grid systems I've installed, I've maybe replaced a, a handful of inverters, some due to lightning, but they just work and work and work. So highly reliable uh, equipment. So um, let's see, let's get into the fun stuff. Um, so I've thrown some switches and hopefully no smoke will happen. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Tony, yeah. you want to just touch on the efficiency advantage of the AC coupling really quick? Oh, yeah, yeah, right, thanks. That's what I I miss. So, um, so if you're building a system from scratch, you, you have the choice of connecting your solar array DC coupled or AC coupled. Um, why would you do one versus the other? So to Will's point, the reason for using an AC grid tie inverter is it's hyper efficient uh, to the tune of like 96 to 98% efficient. So of all the energy that's coming out of your array, you're only losing about 2% of it after it gets processed into AC power. So really high efficiency. If you go DC coupled, you've got to go through a DC converter because we're, we're running, the, you know, that maximum power point voltage, and you got to get it down to 48 volts. So there's a DC step down, right? So you're gonna lose some efficiency there, and that's in the tune of anywhere from five to 10 percent hit. And then you got to go from DC back to AC, and these inverters are about 95 percent efficient, so another five percent hit. So you compound those, and you're looking at a pretty much 10 percent compounded loss versus two percent. So and let's face it, it's rare that the power goes out, so the majority of the time, you're, you want that efficiency. 
that said, and I'm thinking about stuff all the time, I'm like, well, you know, there's actually a cost savings to go DC couple, and it can be to the tune of like $2,000, let's say, right? If you start taking a 10% efficiency and convert that into dollars, you'll find that actually it's only going to cost you about 50 bucks a year. $2,000, that's a long payback period, so there's something to be said for DC coupling too. But anyway, I guess uh, just letting hairs there. Uh, but as I said, the real virtue here is most people already have these inverters or <coughs> it's an easy install. And you don't have to do this now. You can put in a critized system, run with it for a while. In the future, like, you know what? It'd be really nice to have some backup power. You can just simply add the system. So that's the real virtue of it. You can just seamlessly connect the system to an existing system without rewiring that existing system. So, so uh, any questions on that? Or throw some switches? <coughs> so I'm going to go off grid. We don't know we're on grid right now, but um, let's see. We'll do a couple things. We'll turn the lights on so we can see that we're we actually are using electricity. Not <laughs> the switch behind you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So these will come on slowly, they'll, they'll warm up, you'll see more light, and let's see, um, so what is, yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll just use that as an indicator that we've got power, so we've got power, so um, I'm going to go out, I'm going to throw the switch, so we're off, off grid, and then, um, yeah, and then we'll go, we'll go on battery power, so I need to go outside because the meter's out there, and I'd have you all go out there, but it takes 10 minutes to go do that with everybody, <laughs> but um, the net meter's out there, the main system disconnect is out there. So I'm going to go throw that switch, and then um, we'll lose the grid time inverter. So we'll go through a power outage, and then I'll go on battery backup mode. So just one sec.